Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Patricia Kong from Scrum.org, um, and I will be moderating today's Scrum Pulse for you. Very um, happy to have uh, three talented speakers um, who are going to go through this very long title of Four Dimensions and 12 Aspects of Business Agility, a Structured Approach to Help Teams Succeed. So um, I did my due diligence and actually asked the speakers um, what what we might learn today and what that looks like is that we're going to be talking about a way to align interpretation of agility. There's a lot of different interpretations of agility in organization. Um, what does that look like when we're thinking about that from a data aspect and how can we use empiricism to become more agile? Um, Ravi's going to talk about how would we quantify what we usually think are gut-based assumptions. How would we quantify that to get some alignment in the organization. Um, I work a lot around something called evidence-based management. Ravi, Nagesh, and Steve are gonna give you some starting indicators of what you could use um, in terms of measurements to get started around EV, EVM to, to create that alignment. Um, if we have time, I suppose we could go through some case study and role-playing. They've promised to make it very exciting and to do a lot of knowledge sharing. Um, I'll be taking your questions throughout so um, feel free to, to put your questions in as we go along, um, and that'll be it. So one thing is, is that if you're familiar with Scrum Pulse on the right side, um, you can enter your questions in there. Uh, we, do, we will be muting everyone, so that will be the best way to interact. My colleague Lindsay is behind also to answer any of your technical questions that can come through. But again, feel free to put in those questions and comments. We'd really like today to be interactive. So just a little bit more um, on who is Scrum.org, and then we'll get started. Uh, Scrum.org is the home of Scrum. We help people and teams solve complex problems. We're a mission-based company uh, looking to improve the profession of software delivery. We're founded by Ken Schwaber. Um, you can see his, uh, his attractive photo right there on the left, and we are really focused on consistency in a global community. So uh, the speakers today are part of our global community. You are part of our global community and really help us to, to think about how we can bring training and education um, across the globe. Um, and what we learn from you and what we learn from our, our customers it really drives the thought leadership that we can, we can uh, validate um, with organizations. So with that intro, I'm going to pass it along to these gentlemen um, who can introduce themselves, and I'll be watching your questions, and I'll be back on at the end. All right. Thank you, Trish. Uh, quick intros. Uh, I'm joined today by two of my heroes, Steve Talent. He's the director of Agile Enablement at Smooth Apps. He's also kind of acting like our chief product officer, uh, developing a new product, which we will be using today as part of our uh, webinar, God willing. Uh, Nagesh is my friend um, from from India. He is the CEO of Flowsphere India, tons of certifications, and we've had the privilege of working with Nagesh and real world clients. And this presentation is based on what we've learned together. Uh, and I'm the uh, uh, Scrum.org PST like Nagesh, and uh, I'm the co-founder of or the founder of Smooth Apps. All right, uh, let's dive in. At the beginning of our journey, so when we engage with a client, uh, it's an exciting new journey. Everybody wants to be agile. And uh, when we begin, we start asking some questions. What's going on? Uh, where would you like to be as we travel on the path to agility? And here's what management typically tells us. Uh, we, uh, this is, by the way, a real world client, right? First conversation, the CEO of the company, I asked the CEO, what's going on? And here's what the CEO says to me and says, Ravi, here's our perception of the product organization. Uh, the delivery organization is slow, like molasses or slower. Uh, it's broken. Whenever they finally get around to delivering something to us, it's broken. Uh, whenever they fix the defects, they say they, they use this jargon called minimum viable product, but the product is so damn minimum, minimal, it's not viable, right? It's completely useless. Uh, and finally, it's just, you know, we have all these releases that we can't deploy to production or we can't use to meet business goals. So it just feels like all our payroll or our investment, it's just going down the drain. It's like a bunch of trash, right? This is their perception of product delivery. So then we go and start talking to the delivery team members 
And here's their perspective. They're saying, look, these stakeholders, they are uh, chasing bright, shiny objects. There's a new bright, shiny object every week. Uh, and we can't keep up. We're getting whiplash from all the shiny objects they want us to chase. And they are not aligned. Executives are pulling and tugging in different direction, and we are getting caught in the crossfire. Who do I keep happy? All these powerful executives, VPs, they, are all, they have their own personal agenda, the professional agendas, and we get caught. And then we, because they are not aligned, you have decision by committees. So all the decisions get postponed to a steering committee which has the C-suite and VPs, and because their calendars are so jam-packed, sometimes we might not get a decision until two or three months, until the next executive round table committee, whatever you call it, has a quorum to make decisions. And then when we go and ask them for help, it's like, suck it up, buttercup, deal with it, man. I don't care, uh, be agile, right? So we had this kind of split screen moment. Uh, on the one hand, we are listening to stakeholders and executives, and this is their perception of the, the delivery organization. And then you're listening to the delivery organization, and that's their perception of the executives. And it's all a bunch of finger pointing. And so now we're wondering, what do we do about this, right? And this reminds us of individuals and interactions over processes and tools. We have to start with human beings talking to each other in a constructive, in a courageous, and a compassionate way. And the challenge oftentimes for us as Agile coaches is how can we engineer this? How can we use processes and tools as an enabler to human beings talking to each other in an effective and a helpful way? So we start thinking, what can we do? And one hypothesis was, well, what if we use Scrum and what if we use the sprint review as a stepping stone to getting these people with diverse perspectives to talk to each other. Uh, one thing I recently learned in, the, uh, in a course I attended this weekend, it was a course by Orsk, Orsk Fundamentals. And one of their principles is everybody is right, but only partially, right? So each one of us has a piece of the puzzle and the truth is a synthesis of all these pieces, there's a greater intelligence. And could we use the sprint review as an opportunity to allow that greater intelligence to emerge? So that's what we were trying to engineer. We did the first sprint review, Nagesh, Steve, and I, and then we paused for feedback. Crickets, sorry, wrong, I, wrong image for the American continent. This might be better, crickets, silence. Didn't hear anything, not a peep out of anyone highly confused like what the heck just happened so the team is celebrating man that was the best sprint ever let's spike the football we are champions and then we find out the moment the executives got off the sprint review call they picked up their phones and started blasting the executives in the delivery organization and started saying that was the worst sprint ever what the heck is going on unacceptable now, we were very confused. What just happened? Like, we engineered the sprint review as an opportunity for individuals and interactions. Obviously, that hypothesis has now been proven to be invalid. All right, back to square one, finger pointing. Not quite. So what we realize is agility means different things to different people, right? It's like the blind man with the elephant, right? Someone is looking at the, he's feeling the, the trunk and saying it's a snake. Different people are looking at different aspects of the organization, different aspects of agility and interpreting it differently. So we said, okay, hypothesis number two, what if we created some guardrails to guide the interactions? Maybe we need a little bit more guidance, okay? So how do we do that? So one idea is we came up with a four-dimensional model of agility. Here's a caveat. This is not the only way. This is not the right way or the best way. It is only a way. If it resonates with you, try it. If it doesn't, come up with something that makes sense in your context. So based on our experience together, Nagesh, Steve, and I, we came up with this four-dimensional model. And uh, the four dimensions of agility are culture, delivery, quality, and value. Let's double click. Let's zoom in. Culture. It has to be data-driven empiricism based on what's happening in front of us, servant leadership, leaders, measuring their effectiveness in terms of growth of the team, trusting and supporting the team, removing impediments, and the team 
finding the best path to the destination. So these are the three aspects of the first dimension. Let's talk about delivery. We need to have reliable data-driven forecasts. We need to have an approach to optimize flow, and we need to have frequent uh, releases of valuable products, right? Thin vertical slices of value. Let's talk about quality. We need to define quality effectively. We need to have effective quality targets. We need to have an approach to building technical excellence, building quality in and technical excellence. And now we need to execute. So we deliver high quality increments, right? And finally, value. We need to have business outcome-based targets, not velocity. Uh, that's not going to help us. You can all easily gain velocity, but we need to have meaningful outcome-based targets. We need to have an approach to achieve those targets and we need to execute, right? Again, this is a highly flawed model. All models are flawed. Some are useful. If it resonates, try it. But try to get alignment in your company in terms of what does agility mean to us, all right? So if you convert that to, uh, let's say, uh, a circle, this might be how it looks like. And what we started suggesting to clients is a maturity model, highly subjective, highly flawed, but something to pro provide guardrails within which we can have the conversation. So what we started doing is telling clients, look, here are the four dimensions and 12 aspects. How would you rate each of these aspects on a scale from zero to 10? Zero is blocked. We need immediate intervention. One to three, we are slowing down. This is a, these are headwinds. Four to six, at risk, maybe okay right now, but we got to watch out. Seven to nine, enabled, and 10, we are so awesome. We are teaching other teams in the organization. Maybe we are teaching the industry, all right? So we converted our pyramid into a radar graph, and you can visually see what are the levels of maturity in our highly flawed model, all right? So this is just an example. So when we provide these guardrails and we start soliciting the feedback of stakeholders, possibly a self-assessment of the team, possibly an assessment by the coaches, you might start visualizing the perceptions of people as a stepping stone to engineering uh, interactions between individuals, all right? So that's our approach, all right? Uh, and then you can also look at trends to see, are we trending up or trending down? Where, what might be the next best step for us to increase organizational agility, all right? So this is our model in terms of creating alignment into four dimensions and 12 aspects of agility, all right? So let's do a little bit of role playing. Imagine uh, we are all working for a company called Parana Foods. It's kind of like Instacart, all right? It's probably booming because people like me uh, are not comfortable going to a grocery store and exposing uh, themselves. Uh, so uh, so we imagine we are all at a sprint review of a company called Parana Foods their widely important goal, their outcome-based uh, success metric is they want to increase EBITDA. Think of EBITDA as a fancy financial term for profit, right? So right now they're at quarter million dollars within 12 months, end of Q3 next year, they want to go to half a million dollars of profit, right? What am I going to ask you to do? I'm going to ask you to pretend to be a stakeholder in the Parana Foods Sprint Review. And why are you here? What are you hoping to accomplish from the sprint review? You want to inspect the increment. You want to inspect certain indicators or trends, and you want to share your wisdom with the Scrum team so that as an ecosystem, we crowdsource the wisdom of the attendees. We surrender to a greater intelligence, and we course correct. That is the single most important purpose of the sprint review. It's not just a demo. It is an opportunity to l understand the present, learn from the past, and change the future. So why are we here? Our, the stance that I want you to be in for the rest of the webinar is uh, observe the indicators and surrender to the intelligence and to share your thoughts on how we might learn from the past, understand the present, and change the future. Most importantly, we want to maximize value, minimize waste, and manage risk. This is what I learned from Ken Schwaber when I attended my scrum.org TSM course in Boston many years ago. Ken kept emphasizing that Scrum is a means to an end, and this is often forgotten. Some people think Scrum is a way to get more work done from less people in less time with less money. What I learned from Ken over the years is it's an opportunity to squeeze more waste and more risk out of the system with less time and less money. 
right? Ultimately, most executives care about one or one or more of these things: maximize value, minimize waste, minimize risk, right? And that's what Scrum is great at. All right. So, uh, what's going to happen next? Uh, I would like you to be a stakeholder in the sprint review for of Parana Foods. Over the next few minutes, we will uh, reveal four sets of indicators along four dimensions, the dimensions of the model of agility. Uh, we'll start with value, quality, delivery, and culture. Then we'll pause and a survey is going to pop up on the chat panel. And we'll ask you to use Google Forms. And based on what you have seen, make some reasonable assumptions. Remember, it's just a role play. So you'll have a bunch of unanswered questions. Make some plausible assumptions and submit your feedback, all right? Uh, the universe collaborating and cooperating at the end of the four rounds of surveys, we will share a radar graph of the agility assessment. And then we'll talk um, and figure out what might be the next best step in our journey, in the journey of Parana Foods to enable greater agility. All right, so that's a, a sneak peek of what's about to happen. So let's dive in. Let's start with the first dimension, which is value. Let's inspect some value-based indicators. So this is the most valuable goal, uh, EBITDA. And you just need to look at the delta between the dashed line and the solid graph, right? The delta shows you the gap between target reality and current reality. And what I learned from Ken Schwaber is, this is where the magic of empiricism happens. When you quantify your forecast and you compare your actuals to the forecast, the delta needs to be mined for all the wisdom. So I, it's okay if you can't read the small font, just look for patterns that jump out at you. Compare and contrast the actual reality with the target reality, right? So that's how we're doing with EBITDA. This is how we are doing with CapEx and OpEx, our budget. Dashed line, ideal, the colored graphs, actual. How are we doing with the cone of uncertainty, the release forecast, the burnout? Dashed line, ideal. And these are the trends of actual, okay? We want to increase revenue. Profit is in general revenue minus costs. So here's how we are trending in terms of our revenue. Here's how we are trending in terms of our costs. I let that soak in. Let that soak in. And then I'm going to show, show you a bunch of new uh, set of indicators also related to value. All right, let's look at some more. Let's talk about what it feels like to be a customer. So this is the wallet share. So this is how much people are spending on grocery delivery services today, okay? And this is the slice of the market we were hoping to achieve or, or win. And this is the green bars are what we actually have, okay? Target reality, current reality. This is the, the size, the cart size. So we were hoping that every month, maybe by now, we should be getting $500 of grocery delivery orders from our customers, but this is where we are. These are the number of transactions we wanted compared to where we are. And this is what we wanted in terms of retention. It takes a lot of money to acquire a customer, and we were hoping that once they come and try out our service, that they will stick with us. So these are the targets, the actual. So these are how many uh, existing customers we wanted to renew or keep working with us, and these are the actuals. Uh, or the new customers. And finally, the customer net promoter score. Again, targets, actuals. So now what I would like us to do, Lindsay, if you could please, if you could uh, on, the, on the chat window, give the attendees the survey. And I would like to give the attendees maybe just a couple of minutes, click the survey, and it's gonna pop up a Google form. Don't overthink it. Team of consciousness, please share your assessment of how agile you think we are. How do we rate along these aspects of the value dimension? Okay. I will give you maybe just a couple of minutes and then we will move on.
it will be a scale of zero to 10, one dimension of value, three aspects. Do we have the right targets? Do we have the right approach? Do we have the right execution? What do you think? If anyone is having technical difficulties, please post a message. Maybe 30 seconds more, and then we're going to move on. Starting All to right. see some responses in the question box actually. Some are saying four out of ten, some are saying five out of ten. All right. If you can click on the if you can click on the link that Lindsay has posted on the chat window and it pops up a Google survey, but if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. Send us feedback in whatever form is convenient to you. All right. Trish, thank you so much. All right, let's move on. So now, we will continue our journey. <clears throat> let's zoom into some indicators for the second dimension, which is delivery, All right? Oh, looks like there was one more, which I missed. Uh, customer escalations, um, these, we wanted them to trend down, but actually they're trending up. All right, uh, let's go down to, a switch to delivery focus. So this is going to be busy. Um, I apologize. So this is our release cumulative flow diagram. It's showing us how much inventory do we have, how much new work we have that we haven't started. The amber is things which are approved by our product owner. We want to work on it. Purple is print ready. Uh, then we have blue. This is in progress. And then we have done deployed in production dark and so on, all right? So this is the state of our backlog and how much inventory. This is our cycle time from the time that an item is funded to the time that it's actually available to our customers in production. Here's how we're trending in terms of sprint ready items. How well understood is our backlog? Now we are switching focus to what goes on inside of a sprint, so this is Let's say we are on the 10th day of a sprint, and this is how things are going. Take a look at this and see if it tells you anything about the effectiveness of their adoption of Scrum. How long does it take for them to take an item that is sprint ready? From the time an item, that an item goes to active inside of a sprint to the time that the item is actually deployed in production. What is the distribution of aging of items, right? So we've got a bunch of items which are a few days old, and then a bunch of items that are extremely old. What does this tell us about the state of agility of this organization? How much work in progress is there in the course of a sprint? Light blue is in progress, then you have acceptance ready. And how is the forecast or the confidence level of the team in meeting the forecast evolving over time, right? So, bunch of items here. Uh, Lindsay, could you please share the link to the delivery survey, please? Thank you, Lindsay. So again, you'll have a Google Forms link pop up and the chat panel, click the link, assess each of these three aspects of delivery on a scale of zero to 10 based on the limited information you have received so far. Make plausible assumptions as needed.
30 seconds, and then we'll move on. All right, start wrapping up. All right, let's look at some indicators for the third dimension, that's quality. So here's what's happening. Here's the innovation ratio. Green is the, the percentage or the number of, the proportion of sprint capacity that has been uh, used up to deliver value. Red is the proportion of sprint capacity used up to fix defects, all right? Uh, here are our trends in production defects. <clears throat> Dash line is where we want it to be. The bar graph, the stacked column graph is where we are. And here's how we are doing in terms of our test case execution. Red is blocked, can't even execute the test case. This dark amberish thing is, couldn't even run it not run it, chose not to run it. These are failed and these are successful. Okay, okay. So based on these three sets of indicators, if you could share, what is your assessment? Lindsay, uh, can you share the link for quality, please? Well, Lindsay, does that, Ravi, could you um, give a high level overview again of what you're looking at for innovation ratio product defects and test cases run, just so that people have a, a broader understanding? Yeah, what we are looking for in terms of innovation ratio is most businesses do not, I'm hearing an echo, uh, most businesses do not want to waste time fixing defects, injecting defects, and then fixing defects. What businesses want to do is they don't even want to inject defects. My mentor, Mark Nonamon, speaks about defect prevention and quality assurance. So the intent, my understanding of the intent of innovation ratio is to create transparency into how much of payroll is being spent in fixing defects. And seeding the conversation, what might we do better as an organization so we don't spend payroll injecting, detecting, fixing, verifying, and then deploying defect fixes. Instead, let's just focus as much of our payroll on value. So that was the intent. Uh, production defects, here, this is feedback from the market. Uh, what, what is the quality or state of excellence uh, of our increment in the market? Uh, that's production defects. And test cases might be a leading indicator to the lag indicator. So, uh, Test cases are a flawed model of how the market customers, users might use our product, uh, but they're better than nothing. So sometimes if you have a spike in failed or blocked test cases, chances are it may be a precursor to, to you know, more production defects and which may be a precursor to a low innovation ratio. So Trish, does that provide context? Yeah. Any questions? All right. Thank you. So, you're welcome. Let's just take 30 seconds. Lindsay has shared the uh, survey link. Please take a few moments to participate in the survey. All right, and now let's go to the last and the most important and the most neglected aspect of most agile efforts that I have been part of, the culture. Uh, the cliche, culture eats strategy for lunch. And um, I have seen that to be very true. Uh, we neglect culture, we focus on things like velocity, but velocity and other aspects of business performance are purely a manifestation of the underlying culture. And if you don't fix the culture, uh, 
you are probably destined to not meet your goals. So anyway, let's look at the partner engagement. So many companies do uh, engage with trusted partners in their delivery. Uh, this is what it feels like to be a partner of Parana Foods. If our partners are demoralized, they don't like working with us, then it's, it's possible that the quality of our solutions, the value provided uh, by our solutions may not be as awesome because our partners are not motivated to, to help us out. So this is what it feels like to be a partner of Parana Foods. It could be a software delivery partner. Uh, this is what internal business stakeholders feel about their interaction, their relationship with the product and the organization building the product. Right? This is what it feels like to be an internal stakeholder. And this is what it feels like to be an employee uh, or a team member working on the Piranha Foods product. Right? One thing I heard was, you know, be careful how your employees feel because they could get pissed off and leave or what's worse, they could get pissed off and stay. Either way, it's not going to end well. So you've got to take care of your people. And you know, this is something I, I also learned. I read, a, I read a book called How Starbucks Changed Your My Life. And the person who wrote that book used to work at Starbucks. And what he was saying is, because Starbucks treats its employees well, the employees treat the customer well, right? So I cannot overemphasize how crucial it is if you are traveling on the path of agility to take care of your people, okay? This is servant leadership, and I've, this is not a, a, a graph I have seen many of my clients or organizations use. How many impediments are there? Because this is the job of a servant leader. If you want to trust and support your team, and if you're not removing the impediments that they can't remove, you are not doing a good enough job. How long does it take for servant leaders to close out impediments? And what is, uh, what is the age of impediments? And how long does it take for our servant leaders to remove our impediments? Very often we don't focus on this. So there is not a two-way accountability between the team and the servant leaders because there is no mirror in the face of the executives to show them the efficacy or lack thereof of their leadership, okay? So seeing what you see here, please share your assessment on the cultural agility of Parana Foods. Uh, Lindsay, if you don't mind, could you please share the link for the culture survey, please? Thank you. I'll give you maybe just 30 seconds. We're running short of time. Stream of consciousness, share your sure. feedback, please. Ravi, um, could you repeat the name of the book again? How Starbucks Has Changed My Life. It's an amazing book. I love it. You know, it, uh, one thing that amazed me is Starbucks is probably the one big chain where I have had the most consistent experience, different continents, different locations, but least inconsistent experience. I'm usually welcomed with a smile. And I was wondering, like, what's going on? These are minimum wage workers. Mm -hmm. And if you read that book, you will understand there are certain things Starbucks does which might make the experience of going to a Starbucks different from going to the uh, any other big big chain. Yeah. Anyway. Before right. you before you move on, can there's just a, a a good question I think that came in that that I'd like to clarify for everyone. Um, but what's the difference between the impediment age and impediment removal time? So your last two charts there around servant leadership. Yeah, so the, there might be a bug here. I'm not sure. The intent was the age was supposed to be a frequency or uh, like a histogram that showed either a histogram or a distribution showing at any given point in time, uh, in any given sprint, how were these impediments distributed? So, for example, how many impediments are zero to uh, one week old? How many impediments are one to two weeks and how many impediments are like one month, you know, two weeks to one month or more than one month, or one quarter. Um, the intent was I've been in so many companies where the executives 
are beating up on the team to say, why do you guys suck so bad? Why are you not delivering fast enough? But what is not transparent is that there are certain impediments that have been languishing for six months. And the team has been asking executives, please help us. We don't have environments. We don't have a data set. We need this training. Can you give us a license to purchase Selenium for automation testing? And though the executives don't respond, so the intent of this graph, there's a bug here, I apologize, I didn't catch it in time. The intent was to show uh, how the age of impediments is trending over sprints. The removal time was from the time that the team, it's like a cycle time for imp imp impediments, from the time that the team says, here is something that is preventing us from delivering value outside our sphere of control. A executives, can you please help us by removing it? How many calendar days does it take for the executives to remove those impediments? So both are different lenses from which we are examining the same problem, which is how responsive are the executives? Um, how effective are they as servant leaders? So that was the intent, and I apologize for the bug. All right. Okay, so, uh, so now let's move on. So now this is the point at the sprint review where we have created transparency into the increment. We have created transparency into trends, evidence-based indicators. And now we, uh, we could use a tool that would show the radar graph. So let's imagine this is where we are. Imagine that the dashed line is what the organization identified as the target for their agility. And the solid line is what the stakeholders are providing as feedback in terms of the current state of agility. And we can also see the trends. So here's what I'm gonna ask you to do is in the chat panel, based on what limited information you have about Parana Foods, if you were to recommend one adjustment that our ecosystem should consider before the next sprint review, what would that be? We did the transparency, the demo, the, the increment, and let's imagine we did the demo of the increment, and then we also looked at these trends. We did the inspection. We compared the actual reality to the target reality. Now it's time to set the stage for adaptation, the third pillar of empiricism. So in the chat window, answer this question. What is the single most valuable adjustment you would recommend as a result of this sprint review that you feel can enable more organizational agility in Parana Foods between now and the next sprint review. Ravi, may I uh, add something here? Absolutely, please go ahead, Nagesh. So while uh, all folks are uh, thinking and typing in the chat window, um, I faced a situation where I was in a sprint review and. Uh, based on the state of the increment, uh, a question was asked to the stakeholders, a question was asked to the development teams, uh, saying that based on the state of the increment and what is the single most adjustment we can make uh, in order to take the smallest step forward, and there was a blank face because there was no evidence and there was no, uh, so there is a saying, comes from uh, John Mato, my mentor, and it says that, Prescription before diagnosis is a malpractice. So when you do not have any kinds of evidence-based measurements to complement, it is very hard for anyone to give any kind of adjustment, any kind of improvement. So why I bought this point was that now you have seen that based on culture, value, quality, uh, that we have some data to analyze, we have some data and this acts as some sort of evidence for us. Imagine if this is not there and you are in a sprint review and executives are being asked, you are being asked as a team member that what is the single most adjustment you'd like to make, then I would not be surprised if you two will also have a blank face. Yeah, and, and Nagesh, thank you for sharing that. It reminds me of a quote, a mediocre solution to the right problem is better than the perfect solution to the wrong problem. So if we misdiagnose the problem we are trying to solve, agility or scrum will just help you drive your car faster into the ditch. Scrum, if well applied, 
can optimize your supply chain, can optimize delivery. But if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. So you've got to be super careful in aligning towards an outcome. And most companies are so eager and hungry to spend thousands of dollars on so-called agile transformation that they don't even pause to define business outcome centric targets. Right. All right. So, so a I lot of people now. have been um, yeah. writing into the, the question box actually, and uh, they are very, very, very re varied as expected um, with different suggestions. So anywhere from, flow to you know seeing how the product owner understands scrum employee satisfaction service leadership value um looking at looking at um different sorts of impediments employee engagement all over across the board got it and this was just illustrative and it's likely that uh, this is reflective of what may happen in a real organization because remember everybody is trying to look at the problem from their bias and their prism and our job as an organization is if everything is important nothing is important so you know and in, i remember a scrum.org professional scrum product owner course there was a slide more organizations die of indigestion than starvation so what we owe it to our company, our stakeholders, investors, users, and customers is as we leave the sprint review, if we could try and align towards, here is the single most important product enhancement we would, or adjustment we would like to consider, and here is the most important ecosystem adjustment. Sprint reviews, I feel, should not be solely focused on product adjustments. The product is a reflection of the ecosystem. And if the stakeholders don't leave the meeting or the, the event with some introspection to say, what are we doing to cause this? And what can we do better to support this team? Then I feel we have squandered an opportunity for course correction. All right. So uh, let's start closing. So we have some time for Q&A. What are the most important takeaways we want you to get from this conversation? align around what agility means in your context. Not everybody will agree, but at the end, play under protest, disagree and commit, or if it violates your professional or personal goals, you can't stomach it, move on. But do not undermine or sabotage the agile enablement and do not pull in a different direction. Align around how you will empirically measure agility. What are the meaningful indicators and how will you gather them? How will you inspect them? How will you visualize them? Align around quantified targets because if you don't quantify the target reality you are striving for, that you cannot inspect. Inspection is a delta between target reality and current reality and that's how you get undesirable deviation. But if you can't even quantify your forecast, how will you find out whether the deviation is desirable? Is there a deviation at all? And if it is, is it desirable or undesirable? So you've got to align around targets. And now you've got to connect the inspection to a cadence. And this is where I feel Scrum is a great vehicle. You use the, attach it to Sprint Review. One of my customers said, when you're trying to build a new habit, create a micro habit and attach it to a pre-existing habit. So for example, he said it was his goal to be more fit and he wanted to do sit-ups, but it's hard for him to do exercises uh, at, at let's say 5.30 in the evening after a day of work. So what he said is, look, every morning I brush my teeth. Why don't I just do 10 sit-ups after I brush my teeth? So there is a pre-existing habit. You don't think about it. You brush your teeth every morning. Let me add another habit to it, which is sit-ups. So if you have a habit like a sprint review, Let's attach these conversations to a pre-existing habit, okay? If people are not, uh, people don't feel safe to verbalize their feedback, give them anonymity. Maybe in the beginning, that's okay. Over time, maybe they will feel safe. Use an anonymous survey like we just did. Most importantly, every event of Scrum is an opportunity to adjust, to learn and course correct. You've got to leave the conversation with uh, some kind of distilled essence from the stakeholders about what the stakeholders feel is the most meaningful course correction. 
one product course correction, one process, culture, or ecosystem course correction, right? So that brings us to the end, some resources. These, all these ideas are based on the scrum.org evidence-based management guide. Uh, they are inspired by these uh, ideas in the guide. <laughs> There's a great video by Mark Noneman on agile metrics. It's a short video. He lays out four kinds of agile metrics. I would recommend you watch that. Uh, Mark has a great webinar on the Scrum.org, Scrum, uh, Scrum Pulse, or uh, YouTube channel on evidence-based management for audacious goals. Uh, Don McGreal did an awesome presentation of Scrum Pulse on agile metrics. Uh, I did one on Scrum Pulse, uh, again, on some agile metrics. And then we have a case study for a real-world company that applied these ideas, and they, they created their largest revenue growth in 10, per, uh, 10 years. It was freaky. Okay, so these are some resources maybe you could look at if this intrigues you. A uh, little bit about uh, us. Um, if you want help from us to uh, you know, explore these ideas, Smooth Apps uh, is one possible avenue for you. We've got a whole bunch of videos on our YouTube channel. We've got blogs, presentations, and webinars. And uh, follow us on LinkedIn. And Flowsphere, that's Nagesh's company. Please uh, reach out to Nagesh or Steve or I if we can help you. Follow the Flowsphere channel on LinkedIn to learn about upcoming events and uh, you know new information from Flowsphere. So with that, uh, we are at the end. Uh, Trish, I want to hand it back to you for Q and A. All right. Um, thanks for that. That was very quick. There was a lot of information there. So I want people to know that um, you will be able to uh, see some of this content or see the content again. It'll be up and posted um, for everyone to see on the scrum.org website. Um, I encourage you to send in um, some questions now. I do have one though um, that I actually get asked um, often and there's, there's a lot of this that is rooted in the ideas of evidence-based management, but I think there's a, seven, uh, a, a question that um, for any of you three to, to think about is that, when we're talking about making progress transparent, how do we engage sometimes uh, management, especially at the sea level, when frankly they're not that interested? So how do you how do you what do you start with if you're not even able to have that conversation? Um, and the understanding is we're just going agile. I think personally at this time, a lot of people might be interested when we're thinking about where we are now um, as a society, right? So in terms of economy and recession and just saying, you know, what, what, what is worth paying for right now? So I'd love to um, get some thoughts from you guys on that. Nagesh or Steve, would you like to share your thoughts? Well, one thing which, uh... I can share and uh, I would uh, be very happy to listen to Steve's ideas also. So it's very easy many times to say that, you know, the stakeholders or the C-suite, they are not interested, but sometimes it is also two way. It is also a lot on us. Do we really understand what their pain points are? Do we really understand what they value? So a good tool, which I have really found helpful is an empathy map canvas. And I would highly recommend you to just do an empathy map of that C-level leader and try to really empathize with that leader to understand that what is this person wanting to hear? What is this person wanting to see? And maybe you will discover that why this person is not interested or not engaging in the sprint reviews. So I'm not sure whether I'm giving you a silver bullet answer for this question, but I hope that in due course of trying to empathize with this person, you will discover your answer. Um, Ravi, Steve, you want to add something? Sure. Steve? Steve, you are, are you on mute, Steve? Maybe double muted or on your cell phone? Yes. Sorry. I would echo that. Perhaps add that uh, are, are we are we communicating information to the C-suite that they're interested in? And if we're just talking about, you know, what was our burn down chart for the sprint? Um, or how many features have we added to the product? Uh, you know, maybe we're not communicating anything that they're interested in. 
Uh, that's one of the reasons that, that Robbie and I have been working on the, uh, the dashboard that uh, he, he showed you today was because it, it points out things like EBITDA and market share and uh, cart size and new customers versus existing customers and the kind of business oriented metrics that the C-switch is usually going to be interested in. And I think one of the, if I, if there was one central theme of what Ravi has said today, it's start, uh, you know, go back to the basics of agile and start doing, uh, start presenting feedback on how your changes in the code are changing the business. Changes in the product are actually having an effect on the bottom line of the business or the top line of the business and metrics that a C-suite is going to be interested in. Yeah, I want to add to what Nagesh and Steve said. So we, the Scrum.org is an amazing course, PSM2. And I attended with Stephanie Aukerman. And, you know, she used the Empathy Map Canvas to help us walk in the shoes of those stakeholders that we are so frustrated with. So those people who are, uh, for whom this idea resonates, maybe you could either look at the Empathy Map Canvas or you could consider attending a PSM2 course. There's another course I attended the PSU course with Gary Padretti, and Gary Padretti introduced an idea of proto personas. So if you want, you could do a proto persona. The problem, the mistake I have made is I have been so frustrated with these stakeholders, and it's almost like creating a caricature of a stakeholder that I do not pause to ask myself: This is a human being with some unmet needs, valid needs. Before I pass judgment on this human being, can I check in with this human being and see what it feels like to be in their shoes? And one thing that has helped me is I ask the question, what are, what's going on in the investor presentation? So if you are a publicly traded company, as an agile coach, I look at the investor decks for that company and their top five competitors. The reason I do that is I'm trying to tap into what does the executive care about, and if I can reframe agile in terms of what is being spoken about in the investor deck or in the meeting with the board of directors, now I suddenly aligned agility with what they care about, and I, they are more likely to show up, okay? And Steve and I recently did a webinar, 10 reasons why sprint reviews suck and how to make them suck less. So if you're if you're curious about some specific techniques, you could watch that on the Smooth Apps YouTube channel. Uh, Trish, back to you. Awesome, thank you um, for those answers. They were very wise, and I think um, represent a lot of experience. Uh, somebody brought up the EBM guide. I want to. This will be the third time I'm publicly saying this, actually. So we recently quietly. Um, published an update to the evidence-based management guide. Some people may be aware, some people are not. And um, one of the things that we talk about in there is the notion of goals. So um, there's a lot around outcome, a lot around output, but this really this notion of goals is in there. So if you haven't seen it, I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look because um, one of the reasons that we put that in there is because you can have this conversation about output, you can have this conversation about outcomes, but when we want to create some of that alignment, um, there's this notion of what's that strategic goal? What does the bottom-up intelligence um, look like in terms of how we're aligned and the different goals that we have? So those are some things that are in there. Um, and then uh, the case study that somebody's asking about, those are on the uh, scrum.org website and um, we can we can put more on the resources there for people to look at. There is um, maybe one last question that we can get into um, from a name that is very familiar to me, uh, from Valar. So the ratings can be very subjective by individuals, right? Even though it's based on evidence, what we see. So how do we get people to converge uh, when we're looking at outputs uh, so that we can decide on the next effective action plan. And I think the interesting thing it, there is around this notion of outputs and conversions. So we have a few more minutes. I, I would say the goal wasn't, um, I, I think the goal was first to uh, amplify or create transparency into the possibility that reasonable people may disagree that what is the most important outcome for the chief customer officer may be different from that for the chief revenue officer, the chief marketing officer, and so on. 
So when people have divergent views of what is most valuable for our company, the intent of these uh, radiators, information radiators, was to realize that these are plausible and defensible ways of thinking. That's point number one. And point number two, in some cases, we can enroll each other to come over to our side and say, in this moment in time, this is what's most valuable for our company. And it's also possible that we may not. And that's why I like the role of a product owner. Uh, the creators of Scrum say that the product owner is the chief value optimizer. And with great power comes great accountability. So at the end of the day, we must uh, empower this person to produce the, you know, uh, optimize the value. And so long as we choose to have this person play this role, we must hold them accountable, but we must let them do their job, right? So convergence uh, may or may not be possible. And at some point, so long as this person is a product owner, we must disagree and commit or play under protest. That's my feeling. Uh, Nagesh, Steve, anything you'd like to add? I'd like to offer a different perspective, yet complementary perspective to Ravi is that I would say the numbers are not important, but the conversation behind the numbers are more important because an, an intention is never to have them converge or diverge, but the intention is for having them to start thinking and open up because now they were not opening up. We are using this as a tool for them to start having this conversation. Yeah, because in the past, they weren't even talking and they were dug into their trenches and they were having these unhelpful behind the scenes conversation. Our goal is, can we get them to have, in, you know, to enable individuals and interactions in a constructive way in pursuit of at least one baby step, one improvement. So that's the intent. Uh, it's kind of like story points. I mean, I know it's controversial. Many people say we don't use story points, but in my mind, story points is, is like a trick. That, that is not the intent. The intent is the conversation you have which creates greater clarity about the intent of the backlog item. That's, that's the beauty, that's the payload. The story point is merely a means to an end, it's never the end. All, All right, right. Uh, Trish, back to you. Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of different questions that um, need some specific answers. Uh, we'll be sending these questions over to Ravi Nagesh and Steve so that they can reply to you um, as appropriate. Um, I think there's a great one in here, obviously, about where can they find the empathy map canvas? How would we uh, be able to find the metrics uh, that you were showing there, especially if we're using JIRA, those kind of things. Um, so they'll get back to you guys on that. I want to uh, thank you everyone here today. So we want you to know, keep coming back. We have a lot of these different types of webinars. We have learning paths um, and a lot of different information in terms of forums. Um, we're on social media. This is called the Scrum Pulse which is actually something that was started by Mark Nonneman and Ravi Virma. Um, so these are different ways to engage uh, with the scrum.org uh, staff and PSTs. We also have the blog, um, but we're also always trying to share information and learn more from each other and with you. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you to Ravi Nagesh and Steve, uh, and we'll talk to you again soon. Scrum on. Thank you.